Good afternoon. Uh, this is my third lecture in my series on Jung for Lehman. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk about how to get into Dr. Jung's work. Uh, if you just pick up one of his volumes of collected works, you might think you picked up a fire hose and you're being expected to sip from that. And so in order to prepare you for that experience, uh, there are a few other things that you ought to look at first. Back in 1990, uh, when I had been working with the Myers-Briggs type indicator for a couple of years, uh, I decided to start reading Dr. Jung's work in earnest. And so a few people recommended that I pick up this book, Man and His Symbols. Now this is the book that Dr. Jung wrote late in his life with some colleagues with the intention of making uh, his work more readily accessible to the average person. And I found it very easy to read. It talks about the processes of transformation of your psyche through your lifetime, uh, beginning from teenage years and going up to people my age and older. And um, it's just an excellent work. And the way I got into it was I started to read uh, two or three or sometimes four pages a night just before I went to sleep. And that process took nearly a year to complete. But at the end of that year, I felt like I had had a year of uh, mental health therapy. And I felt very good about myself. I understood myself much better than at the beginning of the year. And I really thought the exercise was very worthwhile. So I highly recommend that you consider reading Man and His Symbols as the first entry point into Dr. Jung's work. Now, as you see, uh, I mark up books that I read very heavily. It's a habit I've had since college. <clears throat> and I also tab my books. Uh, at a, Every place I put a tab represents a place that I think I can write an essay about what I learned at that page. And what I've found through the last 29 years is that every day when I'm reading Dr. Jung's work, I find something that has immediate impact on my own life. And that's why uh, I've kept doing it. And it's really held me together psychologically for many, many years. And I consider Dr. Jung my friend and mentor now. It's been a terrific experience. There's one other book that uh, might be accessible to you, and that's this book, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Now, this book is uh, a book that was as close as Dr. Jung ever came to writing an autobiography. And basically, he was writing about events that happened in his psychic life. Uh, he didn't feel that his personal life and its history was that interesting. Actually, it was very interesting, and many people have written biographies of Dr. Jung, but this was his effort, and he wanted to talk about uh, the events in his psychic life. And so, uh, Memories, Dreams, Reflections is the book, and it's quite easy to read, and uh, there's a lot in it. The things that's interesting about Dr. Jung's work is his work on dreams and visions. And I just want to give you a sense of it. I'm going to read a passage here uh, from this, con from Confrontation with the Unconscious, which is one of the chapters. And he said, toward the autumn of 1913, the pressure which I had felt was in me seemed to be moving outward as though there were something in the air. The atmosphere actually seemed to me darker than it had been. It was as though the sense of oppression no longer sprang exclusively from a psychic situation, but from concrete reality. This feeling grew more and more intense. In October, while I was alone on a journey, I was suddenly seized by an overpowering vision. 
I saw a monstrous flood covering all the northern and low-lying lands between the North Sea and the Alps. When it came up to Switzerland, I saw that the mountains grew higher and higher to protect our country. I realized that a frightful catastrophe was in progress. I saw the mighty yellow waves, the floating rubble of civilization and drowned bodies by uncounted thousands. Then the whole sea turned to blood. This vision lasted about an hour. I was perplexed and nauseated and ashamed of my weakness. Two weeks passed, then the vision recurred under the same conditions even more vividly than before, and the blood was more emphasized. An inner voice spoke, look at it well, it is wholly real and it will be so, you cannot doubt it. That winter, someone asked me what I thought were, were the political prospects of the world in the near future. This is 1913, he's talking about. I replied, I had no thoughts on the matter, but that I saw rivers of blood. I asked myself whether these visions pointed to a revolution, but could not really imagine anything of the sort. And so I drew the conclusion that they had to do with me myself and decided that I was menaced by a psychosis. The idea of war did not occur to me at all. Soon afterward, in the spring and early summer of 1914, I had a thrice-repeated dream that in the middle of summer, an Arctic cold wave descended and froze the land to ice. I saw, for example, the whole of Lorraine and its canals frozen and the entire region totally deserted by human beings. All living green things were killed by frost. This dream came in April and May and for the last time in June 1914. Now, once you've looked at those books, uh, I recommend that you look at some books about Dr. Jung's work. And one of these books is Women Who Run With the Wolves, and it's by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. This was a book that was written about 20 years ago, and in this book, Dr. Estes talks about how stories and fairy tales are repeating our psychic life and they're a way of learning about what we must do in life. And at one point I used Dr. Estes's explanations of what happens in women's individuation as the basis for a novel I wrote and my own confrontation with the unconscious. I'll talk about that in a future lecture. Uh, but I recommend that book, and also there are two books by Jean Shinoda Bolin. Uh, Dr. Bolin wrote Goddesses in Every Woman and Gods in Every Man. Now, she wasn't trying to be sacrilegious at all. Uh, the gods that she is talking about are archetypes, and what Dr. Jung meant by archetypes was instinctual patterns under which we all live. And so there are many books about these archetypes, but I found Jean Shinoda Bolin's books the best. And they're very useful to you immediately because uh, you can find yourself in these books and you can find what archetype, what instinctual pattern you personally are following in the world today and you can understand what that will mean to you and your family going forward. Plus, you can see the other archetypes and understand what your friends are really like from an instinctual basis. Now, there are two other books uh, that are very useful by second-generation Jungians. One of them is Psychic Energy. Uh, this is a book by Esther Harding. And Dr. Harding was an immediate disciple of Dr. Jung's, and she wrote a complete explanation of Jungian psychology. And as you see, uh, I've marked up this book very heavily for future use in my writing efforts. Uh, and it's extremely useful in helping you understand what Dr. Jung was driving at. The other book, 
is Dr. Eric Neumann's book, The Origins and History of Consciousness. And Dr. Neumann was a second generation Jungian, again. Uh, he was about a generation younger than Dr. Jung, but he is known as the logician of the second generation uh, Jungians, and so he put uh, Dr. Jung's ideas together in a very organized way, just as Esther Harding did in Psychic Energy. And so what Dr. Neumann is talking about here is how human beings developed consciousness in the first place, where it came from and what we know about it, how we know about it. In Dr. Harding's book, uh, she's talking mainly about psychic energy. And you may recall that I was talking about uh, duality and how psychic energy passes between the two extremes in every duality, of which we have thousands in our psyche. What I found very useful after that was to get an Audible book from audible.com called Psychology of the Unconscious. This was really the first book that caused Dr. Jung to split with Sigmund Freud, and it was published in 1912. And audible.com has a good reading of it by a man named Robert Bethune, which I can highly recommend. And I listened to that audio two or three times, and it really did help me understand Dr. Jung's work. Later on, Dr. Jung rewrote the book as Symbols of Transformation, and it became volume five of his collected works. And so that was a vastly updated uh, version of the book. Uh, but I found that the 1912 book on audio made it easier for me to understand because Robert Bethune's reading is very excellent, and I could just understand it as I was driving. Um, later on, I did get Symbols of Transformation, and as you see, I've marked that up heavily as well. So probably in my lifetime now, in my activity with Dr. Jung's work, I've probably read this book four or five times. The significance of this book is that it's talking about transformation, symbols of transformation. What Dr. Jung means by that is that our psyche is constantly transforming itself throughout life. Uh, originally, we are infants, and the first thing that we do in our life probably is suckle at our mother's breasts. But when we're 30, we don't need that function anymore. So our psyche moves on through life, and it takes us through the stages of life. And so if you understand this book, you'll understand more about what's going on in your psyche. But I don't recommend that as a starting point, because again, uh, that's Dr. Jung's direct writing. And again, it's uh, somewhat like uh, picking up a fire hose and trying to sip water from it. Um, I find almost in every sentence some piece of wisdom in Dr. Jung's writing. And it can be uh, a bit much before you get used to the idea and used to his basic ideas. Uh, so it's best to start with uh, some of these other books that I mentioned. Now, a book that I like very much um, because it helped me with religion and with my understanding of God um, is Answer to Job. Job, as you know, is a book of the Bible, and Job was a man who uh, God tested, tested his faith, and uh, God made a bet with the devil, and the bet was that no matter what God did to Job, Job would keep his faith in God, and the ultimate finale of the book, of course, is that Job did keep his faith, but he went through many very, very serious trials in the process. Dr. Jung very reasonably asked, if God is omniscient, why did he test Job? Why couldn't he just say to Satan, 
I know that he won't change his faith. But he didn't. He put Job in a box like a mouse and played with him. Now, a couple of things that Dr. Yun said in answer to Job that I think are very powerful and were very powerful to me because they answered a few questions of mine in terms of my religion and my understanding of God. And mind you, uh, Dr. Jung throughout his life never made a statement about metaphysical God. He wasn't talking about metaphysical God and never challenged the existence of metaphysical God. What he was talking about was what's in our psyche about God. And so a couple of things that I thought were very important from this book were uh, when he said this, what people overlook or seem unable to understand is the fact that I regard the psyche as real. They believe only in psychical facts and must consequently come to the conclusion that either the uranium itself or the laboratory equipment created the atom bomb. That is no less absurd than the assumption that a non-real psyche is responsible for it. God is an obvious psychic and non-physical fact, i.e. a fact that can be established psychically and but not physically. Equally, these people have still not got it into their heads that the psychology of religion falls into two categories which must be sharply distinguished from one another. Firstly, the psychology of the religious person, and secondly, the psychology of religion proper, i.e. of religious contents. Now, I thought this was very powerful because throughout my life I've had pastors uh, talking about God and the heavens and, and uh, everybody used and in the United States when you see a very religious football player make a touchdown he's always pointing up well the fact is that God isn't up God is here God is in your heart and in your psyche uh, and that doesn't make God any less real God uh, and Dr. Jung wasn't making any statement about the reality of God, but he was simply saying that he regards the psyche as real, as do I and as sh should you, because you know that uh, you have many, many things that you think about in your life every day. Your mind is constantly giving you things, and that's all from your psyche. What I was always troubled with was this idea that God is up. And after I read this particular paragraph, I finally got it. And we know that we can look into the heavens all the way back to the Big Bang, and we can look in an electron microscope down to the smallest atomic particle. And in all those investigations which science bring us, there's no God. There's no God there. But God is within us and it is in the psyche. Uh, that's fundamentally what Dr. Jung was saying in answer to Job. Uh, if you want to read more about it, I'll put a link to it on the YouTube channel. And uh, I wrote a long article about this book, and you can find it on Archetype in Action. It's called um, Answer to Job, Review and Commentary. Now, once you've completed that, then you might be ready for uh, what's called the Red Book. And let me just give you a sense of what you're up against here. The Red Book is this book here. And it's, it's a huge book. And in the front of this, Dr. Jung has written his experiences from his, from his uh, confrontation with the unconscious. It's all written in German calligraphy, and he's also done a series of paintings which describe um, images that he was seeing in his unconscious. And as you can see, uh, many of these images are quite beautiful and, and very 
uh, detailed in, the, in their uh, form. So Dr. Young was quite a good watercolor artist, and he wrote this book for about 16 years. From the time he began his confrontation with the unconscious, his own personal confrontation, um, to about 1930, and he kept it private. He never published it in his lifetime, and it was only 48 years after his life that it became known to the general public. Now, it is likely that people like Esther Harding and Eric Neumann had seen this book uh, in Dr. Jung's study, but most people who studied Jungian psychology after Dr. Jung's death in 1961 did not even know that this book existed, and that includes me. Now, the reason it's very important to me is that it contains Dr. Jung's own account of his confrontation with his own unconscious. And he was a psychiatrist by profession, and so he was able to understand what was going on in his life. Um, and he wrote on the back, on the back of this book is a brief quote from him, which I'll read. Um, the years of which I have spoken to you, when I pursued the inner images, were the most important time of my life. Everything else is to be derived from this. It began at that time, and the later details hardly matter anymore. My entire life consisted in elaborating what had burst forth from the unconscious and flooded me like an enigmatic stream and threatened to break me. That was the stuff and material for more than only one lifetime. Everything later was merely the outer classification, the scientific elaboration, and the integration into life. But the numinous beginning, which contained everything, was then. Now, the reason this book became so important to me was that in 1993, I had a confrontation with the unconscious. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about alchemy because Dr. Jung spent uh, the whole remainder of his life after 1928 studying alchemy. Alchemy was the basis of chemical science, chemistry, uh, and at some point it may have been about trying to make gold, but very early on it turned to being also about psychology. And Dr. Jung happened to discover this and did the rest of his life after about 1928 studying alchemy in very, very great detail. I mean, three of his uh, collected works are about alchemy. The last one is called Mysterium Conjunctionis, and it has lots of important information in it about human psychology. And just so you understand that this is uh, really about right now in election 2016 in the United States, I want to read a little passage out of this book where Dr. Jung is talking about numinous experiences. Now this means experiences that are beyond the ordinary, let's say. Numinous experiences are, are experiences where you're taken out of yourself, and they're quite out of the ordinary. And so he says, we only know that in genuine cases, it is not a question of arbitrary inter inventions, but of involuntary numinous experiences, which happen to a man and provide the basis for religious assertions and convictions. Therefore, at the source of the great confessional religions, as well as of many smaller mystical movements, we find individual historical personalities whose lives are distinguished by numinous experiences. Numerous investigations of such experiences have convinced me that previously unconscious contents then break through into consciousness and overwhelm it in the same way as do the invasions of the unconscious in pathological cases accessible to psychiatric 
observation. Even Jesus, according to Mark 3.21, appeared to his followers in that light. The significant difference, however, between mere pathological cases and inspired personality is that sooner or later, the latter find an extensive following and can therefore transmit their effect down the centuries. The fact that the long-lasting effect exerted by the founders of the great religions is due quite as much to their overwhelming spiritual personality, their exemplary life, and their ethical self-commitment does not affect the present discussion. Personality is only one root of success, and there were and always will be genuine religious personalities to whom success is denied. One has only to think of Meister Eckhart. But if they do meet with success, this only proves that the truth they utter hits an, a consensus of opinion that they are talking of something that is in the air and is spoken from the heart for their followers too. This, as we know to our cost, applies to good and evil alike, to the true as well as the untrue. The wise man who is not heeded is counted as a fool, and the fool who proclaims the general folly first and loudest passes for a prophet and furor. And sometimes it is luckily the other way around as well, or else mankind would long since have perished of stupidity. The insane person whose distinguishing mark is his mental sterility expresses no truth, not only because he is not a personality, but because he meets with no consensus of opinion. But anyone who does has to that extent expressed the truth. In metaphysical matters, what is authoritative is true. Hence, metaphysical assertions are invariably bound up with an unusually strong claim to recognition and authority because authority is for them the only possible proof of their truth, and by this proof they stand or fall. All metaphysical claims in this respect inevitably beg the question, as is obvious to any reasonable person in the case of proofs of God. The claim to authority is naturally not in itself sufficient to establish a metaphysical truth. Its authority must also be backed by the equally vehement need of the multitude. As this need always arises from a condition of distress, any attempt at explanation will have to examine the psychic situation of those who allow themselves to be convinced by a metaphysical assertion. Does that sound like anyone we know in election 2016? Well, that's on page 549 and 550 of Dr. Jung's book, which was published in the 1950s. So Dr. Jung really predicted what would be coming down in election 2016. I hope you find that fact interesting. I'm always looking to Dr. Jung's work to tell me something about why things are happening in our society. And I try to think of uh, the psyche in terms of the national psyche and try to understand the meaning of America and the meaning of other countries in the world and why we are always fighting with one another as human beings when we all live on this pale blue dot in the vastness of space, as Carl Sagan. I hope you found this lecture useful in terms of understanding how to get started with Jungian psychology.